like to welcome you to this session, which will be started off by our keynote lecturer, Professor Alex Bell from the University of California, Berkeley. His keynote address is entitled, Advances in Understanding the Chemistry of CO Hydrogenation. Alex? Thank you. 
A second question of interest is to ask about the ornaments that are produced as primary products of CO hydrogenation. Do these products simply then exit the reactor, never to react again, or do they undergo secondary reactions? Well, we certainly know that they undergo hydrogenation to produce paraffins, and the alcohol ornaments were isomerized to produce beta and gamma ornaments. But what about the possibility that these very same elements participate in chain initiation and chain growth? This is a more subtle question and one which hasn't been answered fully in the published literature in the past. So what we have done is to address both these questions. And this work has involved in part theoretical efforts and in part experimental. The first question is the result, the work on the first question is a result of a collaboration I've had with Dr. Yevgeny Shostorovich of the Kodak Research Laboratories in Rochester and has been a theoretical study addressing the question of the participation of hydrogen in CO bond cleavage and the effects of metal composition on that process. The second study over here on open participation in chain initiation and growth has been experimental in character. It was conducted in Berkeley with one of my graduate students, Deborah Jordan. So let's look first at the first topic and ask what is the justification for even thinking that hydrogen might participate in CO bond cleavage. The earliest evidence for such a process comes from a paper by Ho and Peter Harriot from Cornell, published in 1980, that showed that the Bouvard reaction, the disproportionation of CO to produce nascent carbon, <coughs> proceeded more rapidly over a supported nickel catalyst in the presence of hydrogen, and that the activation energy for this process was reduced. A similar set of results were obtained in my laboratory, working with Jeff Reek, but now on a palladium, supported palladium catalyst. And here again, we observed that the disproportionation of CO on palladium is a difficult process, requires high temperature, but in the presence of small amounts of hydrogen, the threshold for production of carbon could be dropped by as much as 50 degrees Kelvin. Further evidence convincing us that hydrogen does participate in this important step comes from some kinetic isotope effect studies done in Japan by Dr. Mori and his co-workers in uh, Kyoto. And they looked at CO hydrogenation on iron, nickel, and palladium. And the experiments involved chemisorption of a small amount of CO on these supported catalysts, and then a hydrogenation as a function of time using either hydrogen or deuterium. And the experimental uh, quantity that was looked at was the hydrogen deuterium isotope effect. And that isotope effect was found to vary in a very systematic fashion as a function of the composition of the metal. Well, to interpret this, the Japanese co-workers proposed that what happens is that CO undergoes a partial hydrogenation form this intermediate. Its structure is not identified. The intermediate contains N hydrogen atoms per CO molecule, and that the dissociation occurs out of this partially hydrogenated intermediate. By applying the rules of statistical mechanics and absolute rate theory, the Japanese co workers further estimated what the value of N would be for iron, nickel, and palladium, and concluded that N would be 1 for iron, 2 for nickel, and 3 for palladium. And that in this fashion, they could match, theoretically, the experimentally observed hydrogen deuterium isotope. Well, we wanted to address this question, Dr. Shostorovich and I, in terms of some theory. The theory that was applied is the bond order conservation method, a theory developed originally by Dr. Shostorovich. This theory has been described very nicely in a series of papers in surface science, summarized last year in a review of surface science reports. What the theory allows you to do is with a minimum of experimental data and virtually no empirical coefficients to calculate the atomic heat of chemisorption, molecular heat of chemisorption, and the activation energy for simple elementary processes occurring on the surface. So what we have done is to take this theory and apply it to the question of CO hydrogenation 
Because to some of you who may be unfamiliar with the elements of the theory, let me very quickly, in just a few slides, summarize the essence of the technique. I think it's rather easy to appreciate what are some of the critical components. First of all, there are a series of assumptions. The first is that all, there, there are interactions between the absorber <coughs> and the surface, and that we look at center-to-center -center interactions, these two center interactions, and describe the potential in terms of a Morse potential, which is defined here as Q. And it's given a functional dependence upon bond order X. This is the chemist's concept of bond order. And here, everything is scaled to Q0, which is the bond energy for an absorption through a single bond on top of a metal atom. Now, if we place the absorbate, let's assume it's an atom, in a 3 volt hollow, a 4 volt hollow, or a 5 volt hollow, depending on the symmetry of the surface, then we can re-express the heat of absorption in terms of the sum of all the interactions between the absorbate atom and the metal. Now again, we use the scaling value of energy, Q0, the heat of absorption for an atom on an on-top site with a single bond order. Then we define for each interaction with the surface an appropriate, uh, an appropriate bond order, or partial bond order over here. And then we sum over all of the contributions I equal 1 to whatever is the appropriate upper limit. The further constraint we introduce is that the sum of all bond orders must equal 1. This is a normalizing principle. It's empirical in character, but it turns out that when one applies uh, ideas of uh, quantum mechanics to this problem, one can show that this empirical result is well supported. So these are the rules of the game. Morse potential, we sum all two center interactions to get the total heat of absorption, and we can serve on order. Now, using this approach, one can calculate atomic heats of absorption. If we have a coordination number for an atom that's greater than one, then we can represent the heat of absorption according to this simple algebraic formula. If we have molecular heat of absorption, we have a slightly different formula. Again, the coordination number appears in it. The principal scaling factor is <coughs> the heat of absorption of the uh, A atom, the one attached to the metal for a single order bond. And then the other parameter appearing here is the gas phase dissociation energy. And with a formula like this, one can handle the heat of absorption of atoms, molecules, and even molecular fragments. Another thing that one can do with the bond order conservation theory is to calculate activation energies for simple processes. Now, I've identified three generic processes here. The first is the dissociation from the gas, field, the gas phase of a molecule AB to produce absorbed atoms A and B. And here, the activation energy for that process is given in terms of the dissociation energy of the AB molecule, the heats of absorption of the A and B atoms in appropriate combinations. One can also handle the dissociation from the absorbed state of AB, and this is simply this result to which we add now the molecular heat of absorption. And finally, one can handle the reverse process, the recombination, associated recombination of atoms to produce gas phase, AB, and again we have our simple algebraic expression given in terms of the heats of absorption of the individual atoms. What we have done is to apply these simple formula to each of the possible elementary steps involved in CO hydrogenation. I'm going to show you examples for both nickel and palladium. This is the case of nickel, a assumed 111 surface. I'm showing here three energy trajectory plots that one can generate for different reaction schemes that one might postulate. <coughs> Let me guide you through these. Scheme A assumes that we start from chemisorbent CO and hydrogen, and that the CO bond is broken by direct dissociation, produce carbon and oxygen. 
The activation energy, in this case, is 67 kilocalories per mole. After the carbon is released, you can see it adds hydrogen in a sequential fashion, eventually to form methane. I'm only going to concentrate on the front end of these processes up to the point where we sever the CO bond, because the message I'd like to deliver really centers on this aspect of these calculations. Scheme B involves, again, starting from the same place, but this time going to a partially hydrogenated CO, namely a formeal species, and then considering the possibility that this formeal species will dissociate into carbon and OH groups. Now, we could have considered the alternative possibility that we get dissociation to oxygen atom and CH group, but it turns out that when we calculate that possibility, the activation energy is much greater. So this, in fact, appears to be the preferred route. Notice that the activation energy for this first step is of order 50 kilocalories, and then we add another 17 kilocalories to that, such that the plateau, to clear this hurdle here, is again of order 67 kilocalories, which happens to coincide with the value here. Now what we learn at this stage is that there are two alternative pathways to carbon with comparable activation energy. For nickel, then, we have the possibility of direct dissociation from the CO to produce carbon. Or alternatively, the calculations suggest that we could go through a formeal intermediate, again, to carbon. And then the activation energies in this instance would be comparable. Now there's a third possibility that also needs to be considered. And that is, what happens if this formeal intermediate, rather than dissociating, adds another atom of hydrogen? Clearly, it will form a chemisorbed formaldehyde over here. Dissociation from formaldehyde turns out to be, have a very high activation energy and to be prohibitive relative to other processes here. But it is possible that the formaldehyde adds yet one more hydrogen atom to form a methoxide group, and the methoxide then dissociates to release methyl over here. What we find is if we go into the formal state, then with nearly equal probability, we can go this way to methyl, or alternatively this way to carbon, with about the same overall activation energy. So for the case of nickel, we conclude that direct association is a possible route, but complementing that is at least one of two possibilities involving a hydrogen atom to form first this formula intermediate. Now let's look by comparison case of flame, the label of flame is off the screen here. Again, the same three sequences, starting with direct association. In this case, you'll notice that the activation energy we calculate is 100 kilocalories, much larger than for the case of nickel. Well, this coincides with experimental observation. We know that the CO is more difficult to associate on palladium than on nickel. Let's look at the possibility of going via the formeal route. Well, we see, again, we have a two-step process, formeal and then to carbon. The activation energy now is noticeably lower. It's 88 kilocalories. So in this case, we might think that the preferred path will be to go through the formeal and then to dissociate the carbon out of the formeal. But interestingly enough, there is yet a third process which competes in a favorable fashion here for the case of palladium. And that is that CO starts from a molecular state, goes to formeal, but then adds hydrogen to form formaldehyde, goes to the methoxide, and dissociates out of the methoxide to produce the methyl ground. The barrier over here for the uh, conversion of formeal to formaldehyde turns out to be very low. It's roughly half the barrier that it takes to go from formeal to carbon. And so based purely on energetic grounds, one would conclude that in the case of CO and palladium, the preferred path of dissociation is going to be the bottom curve, or curve C. So we go from CO to formeal to formaldehyde to methoxide and then to methyl. So we can see distinct differences that are being predicted here from this theory for the two metals. Let's summarize these results 
then for nickel, it appears that CO bond cleavage can occur by direct dissociation to produce carbon, or by a hydrogen-assisted dissociation occurring through the formula. For palladium, and we've also shown for platinum, we have virtually the same story. The energetics are very similar. CO bond dissociation or cleavage occurs primarily by hydrogen assisted dissociation, but in this case, proceeding via the methoxide. So we can add three hydrogens before CO bond rupture. Now I haven't shown you the energy trajectory for iron, but we've done the calculations as well there. And in this case, we find that there's an unambiguous answer that the only way CO is going to dissociate is by direct dissociation to carbon. Calculate the path via the formula, you find that the activation energy is noticeably greater. So then the conclusion is that direct dissociation occurs exclusively on iron, <coughs> hydrogen assisted and direct dissociation occur on nickel, and the predominant pathway for dissociation on platinum and palladium is through the hydrogen assisted pathway. Interestingly enough, if we ask how many hydrogen atoms must be added, lowest energy path for the dissociation on each of these metals. But how does that compare with the computations of Mori et al. from Japan? We find very good agreement. Here, our value of small n, the number of hydrogen atoms in the end, is zero, in this case one, and in this case three. So within a factor of one, we are very close to the numbers predicted from the experiments. Another thing that is predicted by the theory in which I have to discuss is that the, uh, we can show that methane should be the major product of CO hydrogenation, so C1 product, over iron and nickel, but a combination of methane and methanol should be produced over palladium. But again, in good agreement with what is seen in experimental. So this illustration shows that a relatively simple and straightforward theory, modern conservation method, can give us major information about the systematic variation of reaction pathways as we move from one part of the periodic table to another. And it can also give us indications about the behavior of the uh, 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 products that we're going to observe. Now let me move quickly to the next subject here and talk about these secondary reactions. We wanted to establish the role of secondary reactions in the uh, modification of the product distribution for fish synthesis. The technique that we have used involves the introduction of unlabeled olefins in with C13 labeled CO and hydrogen. By this way, we have labeled two carbon sources with different isotopes. <coughs> Discrimination was done with a GC mass spectrometer. We send all the products through a GC to identify the carbon number. The products are then mixed as they elute from the GC with a small amount of oxygen, combusted catalytically, and all the CO2 is analyzed under the mass spectrometer. By looking at mass 44 and mass 45, one can differentiate between uh, the C12 and the C13 derived hydrocarbon. I'm going to go through a series of experimental slides uh, fairly rapidly here just to give you a flavor for these results. Here we see the results of adding the olefin ethylene uh, by itself with hydrogen. This is a background experiment. And we see a staircase or zigzag, zigzag type of product distribution, which is indicative of chain growth here, or homologation, by C1 and C2. If we use propylene as the additive, we have an even more interesting product distribution. Again, it can be characterized by polymerization of C1, C2, and C3 intermediates, or butene, C1, C3, C4. We have now even a more difficult uh, or kinkier uh, kind of product distribution which we can show here. Now, by contrast, let's look at what happens if you look at just direct CO hydrogenation. Here we have the typical schultz flory type of distribution, high production of methane, low production of ethylene. I should mention that this is for ruthenium on silica catalyst. And now finally, let's look at what happens when we add olefins to the mixture. 
are several points I'd like to bring out. If we're using ethylene as the additive and we put in a small partial pressure of ethylene relative to CO, the first thing we see is a suppression in the production of methane. But interestingly enough, we find also that most of the products derive from the ethylene and not from the CO. But the product distribution from CO and from ethylene look virtually the same, indicating that the source of carbon that enters into the product is not discriminated. So once we produce some uh, monomeric units from which we can grow chains, these chains work equally well for C13 or C12 carbon. If we add more ethylene to the feed stream, we can completely suppress the conversion of CO to hydrocarbons. And now all the product comes exclusively from the ethylene over here. And this kind of product distribution can be explained with a scheme such as the one I'm showing you here. The ethylene enters into the reaction to produce centers of growth involving one, two carbons. It gives us one, two carbon monomer units. CO can only produce one carbon monomer units. As long as we have only small amounts of ethylene over here, we get uh, a, a reaction that involves both the carbon coming from CO and from ethylene to produce the final reaction products. We have a lot of ethylene in. What happens is that most of the ethylene reacts with the CO to produce uh, propanol over here in a smaller amount of propanol. Similar story in the case of propylene addition shown over here, except that propylene is less efficient in reacting with uh, the uh, CO, and so you can put in more propylene before you see the suppression. Again, you see that the amount of methane that is produced is considerably smaller than in the case of normal fischer troch uh, reaction. And finally, for the case of butene, again, a similar story, and again, notice the mimicking of the C13 product distribution and the C12 product distribution. Finally, let's look at what happens to the CO. Where does it go? It goes mainly to react with the element to produce aldehydes and alcohols. And I show that here very nicely. For the case of propylene addition, you produce butanol, butanol, and even uh, the two methyl propanol and propanol, showing that you have both the addition branch and linear uh, derivatives. Finally, the conclusions of this part of the study show that olefins are not passive products, but they do add back to the chemistry in a very complex fashion. As a source of intermediates for chain growth, they turn out to be more active than even CO. <coughs> they react with CO to produce aldehydes and alkaloids. And they offer the possibility here of possibly tailoring the product distribution that we observe from fischer trope synthesis, namely the concept that we might be able to feed back olefins and thereby modify the product distribution. Since I see the chairman has arisen and my time is up, I will conclude on this note and thank you for your attention. Surely the energy that you get out of this thing has to be 
depend on some assumption that you make as to how you're going to partition your bond orders in some unknown intermediate. No. No, it, it doesn't. What, what is very interesting, I can't, I couldn't give you all the background to this, this set of calculations, but in systems where you can test against experimental weapons, uh, such as CO oxidation, uh, hydrogen oxygen reaction, NO decomposition, this theory gives excellent agreement with the experimentally observed activation energies of surface science. Uh, we're projecting it for, we're projecting it forward then. It's trusting the computational algorithm to carry it forward to see what we can learn from it. I see you remain skeptical, but we can discuss this later. No, I'm afraid we will have to move on. Let's thank you for this excellent lecture.